Hello, flat earth researchers, debaters and debunkers. America's space industry frontman Neil deGrasse Tyson once famously tweeted this quote, Math is the language of the universe, so the more equations you know, the more you can converse with the cosmos. It's a very eloquent statement and probably quite true in many respects. However, there is a significant difference between mathematical models and the symmetry of them to the real world and the non-symmetry we find in the real world. And this is a significant issue for both scientists in the field as well as those who wish to support the belief in the globe and only do so by referring to mathematical models rather than reality. In a few moments we'll hear from American theoretical physicist Brian Greene, who I think is being a very honest and quite humble physicist in the explanation and the little story that he gives in the clip that we're about to see. And it relates to this difference or this actual huge chasm really that exists between the mathematical models and an obsession to describe and explore the world around us and the universe in terms of these mathematical models compared to the reality that we discover doesn't have the same symmetry. So he talks about CERN and how much uh, effort and money has been put towards trying to discover new particles, basically create matter or mass from the conversion of energy. And after many, many years, he's come to the realization that they've been going about it wrong, or basically so far, it hasn't given them the results they expected from their mathematical models. And he also himself points out that there is a huge difference between the symmetry of the mathematical model, or models that are used in, in terms of uh, scientific exploration, compared to what they actually discover. So I think it's very pragmatic. And there's another point I'd like to just focus on before that, which, which he kind of highlights as well, and that is this obsession with symmetry that we'll see with the mathematical models that are created. It is, for those mathematicians, a beloved, almost divine thing to see, create, and of course understand the symmetry of a model. And of course there's also been an obsession to somehow describe the way the universe works with a simple equation such as E equals MC squared. And this is of course held up as, as a beacon or even as, as almost the, the only way that we can be scientific about exploring the world around us and the universe. But the, the thing is we have this obsession and so of course we have an emotional attachment and it's interesting that one of the four main obsessions or compulsions with people living with OCD or obsessive compulsive disorder is symmetry and balance fear of germs and forbidden or taboo subjects or thoughts of aggression are also among those traits. But uh, it's this obsession with symmetry and balance which is, is, is a significant trait among OCD sufferers. And of course that is like anything. It, it, it can be in varying degrees and it doesn't necessarily mean that you are in any way dysfunctional or abnormal if you have this kind of obsession. It has its place, it's very useful, and a lot of things in the real world do work very well because of the mathematical models that were created ahead of them. But when it comes to the natural world and 
the science of exploring the natural world, then it turns out that this symmetry of the mathematical models never really quite fits with the unsymmetrical nature of reality. Let's start as we always do with some of your questions, a little bit of roundup on some of the important ideas that people are discussing, debating these days. Let me just see if there's anything in the chat that catches my attention. Oh, Tanzu. Tanzu asks, what do you think about the hierarchy problem? The hierarchy problem. Hierarchy problem is, um, it's actually relevant to what we'll be talking today in some sense with Frank, but the hierarchy problem is this fact that when you look at the various mass scales in particle physics, the masses of the fundamental constituents, and you compare that to the fundamental scale that emerges from the understanding of the strengths of forces, the strength of gravity and the various constants of nature. There's a, a big spread in scales. You no doubt have heard of the Planck mass. Planck mass is a, is a, is a numerical number in the units of mass that naturally emerges by a particular combination of Planck's constant, the gravitational constant, the speed of light. You put them together in the right configuration and you get something with the units of a mass, and the particular amount of mass is about 10 to the 19 times the mass of the proton. 10 to the 19, that's huge, right? So, so the fundamental mass scale that seems to emerge from our description of the forces of nature and quantum mechanics, speed of light, gravity, and so forth, that number is 10 billion billion times larger than the scale of masses that we actually see in the particles in the world around us. So the question is, why is there such a broad spread of scales? And we've been trying to come to grips with that problem for a very long time. The idea of supersymmetry that some of you may have heard of, this idea that for every known particle, there's a partner particle whose quantum mechanical spin would be different in slightly technical language. That idea was partly introduced to deal with this hierarchy problem. The quality of those partner particles within the theoretical framework allows for a very natural explanation for why the particles would have such a low mass. It all comes down to a symmetry principle. Whenever a number is really small, a natural explanation is, well, it must be small because some kind of symmetry keeps it small. I mean, zero is the most symmetric number we know. You multiply it by anything. You divide it by anything. It stays the same. Symmetry is a quality of a system that is unchanged under a whole variety of transformations, right? You take a sphere, you rotate it, if it's a nice silver sphere without anything printed on the surface, no matter what angle you look at that sphere, no matter how you twist it and turn it, the sphere looks the same and it's highly symmetric. Similarly, the number zero is highly symmetric. As I said, you multiply, divide, doesn't change. So if you can find a symmetry that naturally yields zero mass for the particles, then you say to yourself, well, maybe that's why they're so small and maybe that symmetry is not exact. Maybe that symmetry is almost, but not quite an exact quality of the world, the environment. And that would allow the masses to be near zero, but not exactly zero. And this is this approach that supersymmetry gives us. So the problem, of course, is no one's found the supersymmetric particles. Large Hadron Collider, the hope was that it would find all sorts of other particles that we hadn't previously seen partners of the electron called the supersymmetric electron or the selectron partners of the quarks. We'll talk about quarks today with Frank, no doubt. That's where a lot of his profound contributions have been made. Squarks would be the supersymmetric partners of the quarks. Look, I don't name, I don't name these things. Sounds a little silly, but this is a real mathematical theory. And look, a, a $10 billion machine was built in part to try to find the supersymmetric particles. And it's been disappointing that we haven't found these particles. Is it surprising? Well, we never knew the energy scale 
the size of the machine therefore necessary to conjure these new particles out of the void. You know, equals mc squared. We'll talk about this also a little bit later. You can read that as m equals e over c squared, right? So mass can come from energy. So you have highly energetic particles colliding and that energy can be transformed into mass, into new particles. And the hope was by slamming protons together at the Large Hadron Collider with sufficient energy, we'd be able to convert that energy into the mass of these never, bore, never before seen particles. Didn't happen, or it hasn't happened, may still happen. Maybe you need a more powerful machine, maybe their masses are, are larger than we can conjure out of the vacuum, out of the void. So the hierarchy problem and this idea of supersymmetry as a possible solution still up in the air, not as, not as favored as it once was. I mean, when I was a graduate student, I don't know, it was almost a foregone conclusion that the world was going to be supersymmetric, that we would find these supersymmetric particles. Almost every paper that I've written, that's maybe a little exaggeration, but the vast majority of papers that I've written in one way or another have supersymmetry at their core. And some of the papers that I've written are using supersymmetry as a mathematical tool. And as a mathematical tool, it's unassailable, right? It's a piece of mathematics. It doesn't matter whether the world makes use of this supersymmetric quality. When you're doing mathematics, you don't have the constraints of nature breathing down your neck. You can just do mathematics. That's one of the beauties, but also one of the pitfalls of mathematics. I mean, the reason why I personally shifted my focus to physics when I was quite young, it felt to me that the problems of mathematics were just too artificial in a sense. I don't know if that's exactly the right word. They were too lenient. Maybe that's a better way of putting it. I'd like the idea of doing mathematics with the goal of aligning it with qualities of the physical world. But nevertheless, math on its own is enriching, fun, gratifying, and supersymmetry has had a powerful impact in our understanding of mathematics. But as a tool to understand the physical world, yeah, that's still, that is still somewhat up in the air. Click subscribe and the bell icon if you'd like to receive notifications of new videos from Phuket Word.